That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Horizon, an American saga, chapter one, which premiered at the 2024 Cannes Film Festival. Uh, Warner Brothers is releasing it June 28th, 2024. Directed by Kevin Costner. Fourth film, technically directed by Kevin Costner, following his uh, Oscar-winning debut, Dances with Wolves, back in 1990, uh, after followed by The Postman and Open Range, and he's been trying to make Horizon since the late 80s. What is this film about? It chronicles a multifaceted 15-year span of pre- and post-Civil War expansion and settlement of the American West. What's your pull quote? Costner whets the appetite with the first installment of his sprawling western soap opera, a slickly paced prologue planting the seeds of rankling discontent in the unsettling settlement of the American West. Mine. Does Horizon feel jumbled? Yes. Was I completely riveted for the entire three-hour runtime? Yes. Uh, I was reading a lot of negative reviews, uh, or pull quotes, I guess, from Rotten Tomatoes. Mm -hmm. uh, because people are saying that it just feels like a bunch of strings of stories that, that there is no conclusion, which is true. And I guess, first off, we saw the trailer mm -hmm. and I was not interested. I'm not an American history scholar. Like, I'm ignorant to a lot of American history. I, assume it I assumed it would be dry. I know Kevin Costner is in a TV show uh, that's set yeah, in a similar I haven't environment. seen Yellowstone. Oh, Okay. I don't know what I... Well, I knew what I was thinking, that it would be like a dry uh, period piece. Mm -hmm. But this movie, I would describe it as like a violent soap opera set during the gold rush. Well, the gold rush was a little bit before. Okay. But yeah. The... But yeah, I mean, it's... it's it really is riveting. There's so much happening. There's a lot, and sure, of course, that's an argument, and maybe it's not a standalone film, but uh, that's the clue of chapter one. Yeah. So you have to be a little patient. <laughs> uh, but that said, I, I think that it it provides enough compelling material to make me not only interested, but kind of eager to say, see where it's going. For sure. Uh there's so much happening that I can't even really tell the story, except that it's set in like the 1850s, and we focus on three regions, San Pedro Valley, Wyoming Territory, and Western Kansas. Mm -hmm. And there are several plot lines, so I guess I can just start going through them. So Sienna Miller is married with two kids, mm -hmm. and one night her family and the people who they live around are attacked by an indigenous tribe. The Apache. And her husband and her son are killed. Mm, and that son is played by one of Costner's kids. Oh, I thought he was good. But she is found the next day by a sheriff who's roaming the region, played by Sam Worthington. And he takes her in. So there's that going on. Then we have Luke Wilson, mm -hmm. who's heading like a caravan out west. Mm -hmm. Very Oregon Trail. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they're trying to get to a place called Horizon, hence the name, which is like the new frontier. And so they're dealing with um, maybe being attacked by the indigenous people and just basically how hard it was to making that trek. Um, and in that plot line... Will Patton and his daughters have, the la including Isabel Fuhrman, have the last name Kittredge, which is Sienna Miller's last name as well. So they're oh, so they're kinfolk. Okay, there must be her husband's brother or something. I'm I'm assuming. I didn't even catch that. Okay, then Kevin Costner's not really in the thing. So I mean, he's not the main character for sure, but he shows up because, well, he's relevant initially because he shows up to this like little town, and. He meets like the town prostitute. Well, one of them. One of She's them. She's kind of the, on her own, operating her own little business. Named Marigold. Played by Abby Lee. And she gets his ass in trouble because Marigold lives with Jenna Malone. Mm -hmm. And Jenna Malone opens the film. We have to talk about the beginning of this film because it had me going. Mm -hmm. But the opening of the film is Jenna Malone just busts in on some man asleep and shoots him in the chest twice. Mm -hmm. So that and, and takes the baby that is in that in his home. Yes. And we find out that that man has two brothers mm -hmm. who are crazy as hell. The Sykes brothers. Mm -hmm. Yes. And they're looking for Jenna Malone. 
because they want that baby back. Mm -hmm. Probably they want to kill her ass. But Kevin Costner gets tangled up in that because one of the brothers goes to find Jenna Malone and hears that maybe like Marigold knows where she is and bumps into Kevin Costner. And Kevin Costner kills that brother. Well, no, they already know they because they have Jenna Malone hostage at that point. They're going to get the kid. Oh, to find the kid, and they think that the friend has it. And that's played. That brother's played by Jamie Campbell Bower, who you might recognize from the Mortal Instruments film. Then we have two tribes, two indigenous tribes, who are kind of at odds because one, like their area is like on higher ground, and then one's on lower ground. The lower ground uh, tribe. They are the ones responsible for attacking Sienna Miller's people. Led by Pionsene, played by Owen Crowshu. Mm -hmm. So the tribal leader from the higher ground, he's mad because he's like, we're trying to cohabitate. Like, we're not trying to cause friction. And so you doing this is going to really cause us problems. And so when shit gets hot for you, don't come up here asking for my help. So there's that going Basically, on. Basically, yeah. And then you have like Jeff Fahey in there. Yes, because of course the survivor, uh, th the survivors, the survivors of the attack settlement are are bloodthirsty. So they're led by Scott Hayes, who seems right. to have uh, a little more um, acumen when speaking with the Apache. Like he knows their language, and he he's kind of as a go-between where Jeff Fahey, who shows up very late in the game, is just a, a rabble rouser. A problem. Mm -hmm. So, a lot going on. None of it's resolved at all. It really does feel like a soap opera. And something I've never seen before is at the end of this three-hour film, we get like a six, seven-minute montage that's basically like, on next, week episode, <laughs> next week's episode of Horizon, so we are seeing what we might get in the future installments. It reminded me of being a kid with my parents watching Lonesome Dove, and they would have, uh, which is a mini-series based on the Larry McMurtry novel, and th that would happen like that the ne in the next week's episode. I was so surprised. I really was not expecting. I cried. I laughed. There were moments that were extremely tense and mm -hmm. difficult to watch, and yeah, I'm, I'm just so impressed at the balance of it all. Yeah, having to navigate all of these things and put them together in a cohesive story is pretty impressive. And the fact, so chapter two comes out in August, and I believe chapter three is in production or needs to film still. And I think init initially I read somewhere that he wanted four films altogether. Hey, I'll take them. I can't wait to see part two. Mm -hmm. Now, I already said I'm not an American history scholar, so I don't want to hear... Um, I know there are going to be people mad about not just what I'm saying, but just like th the history within the movie. But I, I thought it felt very fair because it's like obviously there were people whose land was taken from them. And then there were people who were trying to get to new land to make a better life for their se th themselves. So I feel like this film tackles the complexity of that in a way that felt balanced mm -hmm. to me. So yeah, I mean, inevitably, uh, any film coming from the perspective of you know the the white creative's perspective is going to have some limitations. And there's some conversations that happen in this film that seem a little too prescient. I think for what I, I would assume. Like, like uh, there's a, a colonel played by uh, Danny Houston who's speaking with Michael Rooker, the sergeant, and Sam Worthington. That's part of his troop. And they're all kind of surmising that, you know, the, after the Civil War is ending, all of these people, uh, survival, survivors will need some go to go, somewhere to go, and all of these wide open spaces are going to become diminished. Uh, so there are major changes on, uh, on the horizon, if you will. Um, Dale, D I think some of the casting is a little curious. A little, some people, a, a, women in westerns. I think this is a, a problem with a lot of filmmakers. Are a little too good looking a lot. Um, but then somebody like Dale Dickey, who's the Sykes brothers' mother. I mean, sh she has a face for. She she has a face for 1850. Uh, but well, the opening, mm -hmm. like the first 20, 25 minutes, because it's like Jenna Malone shooting this man, taking this baby. Then we get the Sienna Miller's family getting attacked. It was very tense. Mm -hmm. And Sienna Miller ends up protecting herself and her daughter by like basically going in like the, the basement of their... They have an underground tunnel. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so she buries herself down there. Um, but her son decides to stay with his dad. And I was tearing up through that entire sequence. 
And I don't, I couldn't even name a movie Sandra Miller's in, but I thought that she did a really good job. And when she drags her ass out of that hole, when Sam Worthington finds her, mm -hmm. I was crying. Well, they're, actually, you, they're, they're actually found by a character named Chavez, played by Alejandro Eda, who I think is a standout here as well, without ha getting much to do. And I don't know him either, um, but he's a snack too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's in he's in the Tom Cruise film American Made. Oh um, yeah, I yeah. liked his character. Mm -hmm. The oh god, during that opening sequence, there's a family that they're in a tent and they they know what's coming. Mm -hmm. So we see them like doing a prayer. Mm -hmm. And then the the Apache are coming to attack them. And I think it's the mom who tells her kids close their eyes. Mm -hmm. And then they ignite an explosive. That felt like a very James Cameron moment, like uh, Jeanette Goldstein in Titanic. It or, got me, yeah. though. It, it really did get me. Uh -huh. the, the, I find the score a little overbearing, at, especially towards the beginning, but it eventually settles in there by John Debney who I think has done a lot of glossy Hollywood productions. Um, but the opening, it opens with, we, we get this shot of ants and almost the shocking uh, cut to this uh, spike being pounded into the earth. And then Angus McFadden, whose face I will forever remember because he was Robert the Bruce in uh, Mel Gibson's Braveheart. He, uh, in a s several segments, moments later, finds the corpse of a, of a, a child with ants all over oh, it. Oh, yes. It reminded me of Peckinpah, the opening of Peckinpah's The Wild Bunch, where these children are uh, torturing ants, which kind of, um, I, I, I think they're ants, which, which kind of uh, signifies this new world order of violence, which was Peckinpah's forte. But to me, what Kevin Costner is doing with those shots is saying that all of these humans are doing this thing, but they, they will all return to the earth, these ants, nature will be what remains after all of this drama. No one's on my worst hair list, but I do have two notes. Marigold, who's beautiful. Mm -hmm. She's an Australian lady. Mm -hmm. There are quite a few Australians in this movie, but... Mm -hmm. um, her hair is stunning. She's beautiful. Her hair looks great. Her little trampy ass purple outfit is really cute. But I just, I thought her hair was distracting because she clearly has like balayage highlights. Mm -hmm. But anyway, and then Kevin Costner, I think there's an attempt to de-age him because I'm assuming as the installments go on, he'll get older. Mm -hmm. But uh, I wrote down, did they have hair dye in the Wild Wild West? But <laughs> uh, Junior Sykes, the, the taller Hemsworth-ish uh, Sykes brother, Jim... John Beavers, I believe he's Australian as well because he's in Animal Kingdom. And I thought he looked, he looks like a model. Several of the men in this look a little too nice. Uh, yeah. Like Marigold, her storyline, um, she ends up leaving. Marigold ends up taking Jenna Malone's baby because mm -hmm. she knows she has to leave that house mm -hmm. because the one brother was killed. But then she meets this very handsome man with perfect teeth and nice floppy hair that did not look real to me like that man and um she he tells her like if you want to be with me you have to get rid of that baby so she drops that baby off with i think like a chinese family the, the chinese immigrants yeah. yeah yes and i again i think if with a little patience we'll have more from the apache more from the chinese immigrants i'm hoping and more from the kids and more from the I'm kids i'm expecting these kids to grow older but anyway getting back to kevin costner and marigold they meet because marigold um, is looking for a man and she sees him and she follows him into like um, like maybe the post office or something and Kevin Costner is there trying to send a message uh, like a letter so he's dictating it to the counter worker Ned mm -hmm. and the way Marigold gets Kevin Costner's attention is she's like um, you might want to ask Ned to uh, read back your letter because that fool can't read mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought that scene was so good there are so many moments that the pacing Maybe it's my, I mean, I don't know, maybe my attention span really likes this kind of stuff where there's so much happening that I can't help but pay attention. It, there is a lot going on, but I think we settle into the, the handful of people who become prominent in, into getting into their storyline. Yes, because initially I was a little worried, like, how am I going to keep track? Like but War it, and Peace. But eventually I'm like, oh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with what's happening. And the tone... There, there are many different tones, but I think they all work well to make this feel like a serious film. It is a serious film. There are moments where it, it almost strays into hokey, almost, but he, it, Costner kind of pulls back uh, at the right moment. I, I, particularly, I'm thinking of the developing romance between Sienna Miller and Sam Worthington. Uh, but, you know, I'm left hanging, the cliffhanger, I'm waiting, what happened to Jenna Malone? Uh, yes. 
Yeah. Because the scene where the Sykes brothers catch up with her, they, they've set a trap. Because she's with a new man, played by Michael Angarano, who has a small role, uh, and they think that they're going to be selling property to an interested party, and it's these brothers that have found her. And they end up killing her. They, her, 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 is that her husband or her boyfriend? Whatever. Um, the... <laughs> So that scene where Jenna Malone and her man go to see about this real estate venture, mm -hmm. uh, she's mad because she had told Marigold, you better bring your ass back to this house by 2 o'clock, because we or 1 o'clock, whatever, because we cannot be late. And of course, Marigold shows up late because she's chasing a man. And the way Jenna Malone is yelling at her, and they're arguing, I just thought it was so funny. Well, they have a really interesting arrangement. It's clear that um, Marigold is living in... Uh, Ellen slash Lucy's house and also paying rent, but the local brothel uh, is clearly uh, quite unfriendly to Marigold's presence in town. Well, because like she's, she's taking away business. business. Yeah. And then Marigold knows Jenna's past. We don't know how much. We don't know if she knows the... Mar Marigold says that she doesn't know anything about these brothers and whatever, but when they're arguing, she talks about, like, I know who you were before you met this mm -hmm. man. Basically saying, like, you're a hoe, too. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I'm very interested to know where she ends up. Okay, Luke Wilson and his caravan. In the caravan, there are two British characters. Mm -hmm. And they're real cute. Juliet, Ella Hunt, and um, I'm forgetting. The guy reminded me of Harry Styles. Yeah, I'm trying to remember his name. But they are real posh. Oh, Tom Payne, who's in um, The Walking Dead. They're real posh, and they don't really... They, they're not contributing to the caravan. And at one point, Luke Wilson has to get them together. And I thought that scene was so good. And it's during that scene that the lady from The Orphan... Isabel Fuhrman. Mm -hmm. she, <laughs> the British lady is clowning her and her sisters, talking about how your dad appears to be raising boys. Mm -hmm. She's basically saying like women shouldn't have to do manual labor mm -hmm. and that's why she's there sitting being pretty. But then her man is not helping the men do work either. He's sitting there drawing sketches. I'm so curious to know how they even got on this caravan. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I really enjoyed that sequence. There is... The, there's a moment, it's where um, Kevin Costner's off with Abby Lee and they're on the run and he turns to her at one moment and he it could have been the tagline for this whole endeavor. He goes... We just got to keep going. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it feels like. Oh, a really tense moment is Sam Fahey's character is in a general store and clearly does not like the indigenous population. And they're trying... He, Jeff Fahey? Right? Mm -hmm. That's what I said, yeah. I think you said Sam. Oh, Sam Fahey. <laughs> anyway, um, there is a scene where a, they basically give a little boy a gun and try to get him to kill one of the indigenous men and his son that had me so tense. Mm -hmm. And thankfully the kid decides like, I can't do this because he senses that it's wrong. And I'm predicting that we're going to the in the following installments. We'll see this boy grow up and be sort of like anti mm -hmm. the movement to get rid of. Well, it's establishing that, you know, these, these cycles of violence are just going to continue endlessly. And that's, that's the, the, Country, what the country's based on. Um, I, I had to laugh at one of the, I think one of the Sykes brothers refers to Kevin Costner as a saddle tramp. <laughs> Another scene that made me cry is Sienna Miller's daughter. She's grown, because Sam Worthington has them staying with his camp. So soldiers are protecting them. I was a little confused why she's getting so much protection. Like she can't be the first woman they've come across whose man was killed. But they're like giving her like, five-star treatment and so the daughter's gotten closer to the soldiers so when they leave to go off to do a mission she runs and give she cuts out like little squares from her quilt and gives them to them and they are so happy and then sam worthington explains to sienna miller that for a lot of these young men who are out here fighting the the only thing they have keeping them going is knowing that there are people who care about them so maybe your daughter should give all of them something so we see that made me tear up and then we see the, the men ride off and they all have their little mm -hmm. pin of whatever she gave them. I think that's Rooker that's saying that. To oh, her was it right Rooker? Mm -hmm. Either way, I mean, it was, it was, it was moving. A really sweet moment. Rooker's doing an accent where I'm like, oh, I wish we had subtitles uh, in a couple of those moments. Sure. But I found him, in, I always find him enjoyable. But then the film ends with a major battle and that's where we go back to a reference that we're told that 
they're they're getting like a hundred dollars per scalp to kill mm -hmm. the Apache. Which is, and then we see them scalping a few people. The film is quite violent. It's not as violent as something like Hostels by Scott Cooper, but again, that's a really good example of a well-intentioned uh, perspective from a, a white film director that's trying to reflect on the violence of the times, but I, I think falls a little bit short. One criticism I read that I would agree with is the film, while I thoroughly enjoyed it, I don't think it looks as grand or epic as it could. I don't think the cinematography is like anything to get excited about. In fact, some shots look like they're standing in front of they either might, a green screen or like a backdrop. They might be. It was shot by J. Michael Monroe, who's uh, kind of assisted Costner ever since Dances with Wolves, and he gave him his this cinematographer his first job as a DP on Open Range. In but I mean, I don't know what the budget was. Maybe you know. I thought I read fifty million. I'm not oh, sure. Oh, I mean they they did a lot with the money, but yes. it, it definitely doesn't feel like they have like the deepest of pockets. But no. but but it looks great. Yeah, I, I don't. I was I, I didn't really have any expectations, but I I was uh, very pleased and uh, I found a lot of it very moving. And I again I'm looking forward to the continuation, probably well, more than I am Avatar for sure. <laughs> what would you give Horizon and American Saga Chapter One? Three and a half. I thought, it, I'm talking about like it's a five star movie, but I think in the fairness, I would give it three and a half out of five. Um, and I can see why people don't like the style of like, it like it feels like a, like an episodic sort of situation. Sure, but I did like the montage at the end. Glenn Turman, can't wait to see who he's playing. Yes, Glenn yeah. Turman's gonna be in the thing. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's all. Join mm -hmm. us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye. <laughs>